The mic's on. If you want it. Well, you they're recording. No, I'm just saying you might need it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. Tell me if you can't hear me. All right. Um, we are the human components of Armstead Mountain Farm. We've been together for 25 years farming in Pope County, which is about one hour and 45 minutes from Little Rock. Okay. And um, we are 11 miles on a dirt road north of Jerusalem, Ar Arkansas, if you've ever heard of that. And um, as I said, we've been farming together yeah. for 25 years. Between us, we have um, five children from previous marriages. Um, and they all worked on the farm with us at various times. And um, from that, I'll hand it over to the Speaker of the House. He really, you'll find out he is the Speaker of the House. <laughs> Not really. Uh, and he'll give you the background of how we actually got to Arkansas, and then I will do my part to try and let you know why I'm here. OK. Um, our history together, uh, we've been together for 25 years, but uh, our, our, both of our histories in Arkansas I'll go back a little further. Uh, this year was 40 years for me. It came in 1972, part of the early Back to the Land movement. Um, we came from Michigan, 11 people in three vehicles. We were going to set up a commune. We were going to go live the good life. We were going to get independent and uh, self-sustaining. Um, and that was the big thing. We read Mother Earth News number one and uh, went from there. <laughs> Uh, we, we, um, yeah, that'll be it. Um, my first wife and I had gone up to Nova Scotia, and uh, we had friends up there that had bought a farm. And I looked at their wood pile. I said, wow, that, that's a big pile of wood. <laughs> and uh, they said, yeah, that's what we had left over. And I go, okay. We had been looking uh, in United uh, Farm a Realty Company and different places in Arkansas kept poking up. And we looked on population density maps, and there was a big hole up there in the Ozarks, and there was cheap land, longer growing season. You know, uh, I was born in Ohio, but raised in Michigan. Sue was from Ohio, and we were looking for that longer growing season. So we came down, and at the time, we, we, one friend of ours had been to another commune up there, probably one of the first ones that was set up, uh, up in No-Go, Arkansas. And so uh, we got to Fayetteville, our three-vehicle little caravan, and uh, we drove all day long. Highway 16 from outside Fayetteville at that time was dirt road all the way past Allred. So we took most of the day, and it was getting dark, and we pull into this driveway and the guy goes, I think this is it. And I said, you're kidding me. It was a two track going off into the woods and it was this other place where he knew he had visited the year before. And I said, you sure this is it? He said, ah, check the mailbox, you know? And I went over and checked the mailbox and it said, Ganja Doobie Boogie Plantation. And I go, well, this is, and yes, this was, the, you know, 60s, early 70s. I, I was at Woodstock actually. Um, so uh, the admissions come out. Um, so we went back in there and there were 30 people living there and we stayed there for six weeks, 11 of us, and it started, you know, the realities of life in the deep country started sinking into some people and uh, by the time we bought our land we had six people. Um, but all our friends from Ann Arbor, where I came from, uh, cycled through and slowly but surely it whittled down to me and my wife, actually, about, and then we had some other people move in. One of them's in the audience here. Uh, and uh, for five years, we did live with other people. Um, during that initial period, uh, uh, my parents died early. I got a, uh, an inheritance enough to buy some registered Suffolk draft horses. And for four, first 14 years, uh, I was on the farm. We used only horses. Um, we raised 90 some percent of our food, not the cooking oil, but even, even uh, planted wheat and bought an old combine that was tractor pulled and had the neighbor come and combine our wheat. So we had our own bread. 
Sorry. And uh, we made our own sorghum. We were doing a lot of different things. Um, no electricity that whole time, kerosene lamps, and then propane, and then we finally got 12 volt system up. We had a wind generator. Um, and we, you know, it was, it was challenging, but a good life. It was hard. Most of the people that came and visited um, were urban people and our friends, and they kind of thought, oh, I'll go live the good life uh, in the country, and we can sit on the porch and watch things grow. Well, it wasn't quite like that. We had 30 acres of old fields that had been abandoned for 35 years. They said they grew cotton until it just would not grow on that land. And they called it bumblebee cotton. It was knee high to a bumblebee in the cotton. It was about the size of a bumblebee. And so we, we probably cleaned out all the neighborhood barns, hauling a lot of uh, compost for compost and everything. Uh, slowly but surely built land up here. I'm just getting on a, a cover crop with uh, a stallion and two mares and one of their babies. Um, so that's uh, an early shot. And so after 14 years, uh, changes were happening. Uh, I went through a divorce. Sue went through a divorce, and she came a few years later than I. And you can so you can kind of give a little history up to where we're together okay, on your you point. Change this. Oh, yeah. yeah. There she is. Um, on <laughs> this wasn't yesterday. <laughs> As you can see. Okay. So, um, I'm curious, just to begin with, how many people here are actually thinking about farming or doing gardening, say? Or are farming. Or, or are farming. Oh. So, we're kind of okay. speaking to the choir in, in some ways. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. my voice carries. I don't think. Um, all right, so I was born and raised in Ohio, and um, with my husband and two children, we moved to San Diego. He was um, a project manager for some real estate development projects, and we, we were kind of hit by that cosmic back-to-the-land movement, and we decided we'd move out into the country out east of San Diego and give it a try and see if it suited us. And we rented a little eight acre ranch and had horses, put in my first garden, which was an utter disaster. I'm telling you, don't ever try and grow in decomposed granite. It, it doesn't work. But that did not stymie my desire to be in the country and grow food, and provide food for our family. And um, after two years, we decided to make the big move. I came to Arkansas to check it out. We had a friend here, and my little five-year-old son and I came to give it a look because we had checked a lot of the land catalogs, and Arkansas land was very reasonable, very cheap. We bought our land 80 acres for $24,000 at that time. Which land had gone up in those three years. We yeah, paid, we paid $130 an acre for our place when we bought it. And two years before that, it had sold for $75 an acre. So, um, yeah. That was a big draw, you know, and taxes were low. Where we were in San Diego, out in the country, taxes were <clears throat> extremely high. And um, of course, the land was in the thousands of dollars an acre. So we knew we needed to look elsewhere. So I come to Arkansas, and I was captivated. I was immediately drawn to the people and the culture. I mean, you drive down the road, dirt road probably, or even not a dirt road, and um, people would wave at you. You've never, ever met them. You have no idea who they are. They wave, you know, and, you're, and I'm coming across 16 at that time. It's a road that goes yeah, from, like, it. Clinton. Yeah, yeah, it's dirt. But you got to stop for the pig, you know, to cross the road. So anyway, this all really appealed to me. And being a little bit of a rebel, um, and my husband was an adventuresome guy, we decided we're going to get out. And um, also, we were reading a lot about Back to the Land, and especially influenced by Helen and Scott Nearing, who homesteaded in um, Maine, built up their, their place by hand, rock house and rock walls around their garden, 
grew all, almost all their own food, and they were great advocates of living the good life, the simple life. They were going to work four hours a day, read and write for four hours a day, and then pursue their various hobbies, music, whatever, four hours a day. Well, it really didn't work out that way. It's more like 16 hours a day of farm labor, but um, that's OK. We found that out. And of course, they wrote books. And we do have a list of reading material that might be helpful if you're thinking about farming or even gardening. And their book was Living the Good Life. Um, so they made, we, they made their quite a bit of money on publishing books as well. So anyway, we decided to raise blueberries. The University of Arkansas was promoting that as a means of farming and a way to make money. And we put in two acres, about 2,000 plants. And um, it, it, it did not really produce the yields that were projected to produce. And, um, but we did make a living at it for a while. It required a lot of labor. And in fact, the last year we were in production was 98, 97. We, ha we had to hire 35 people through the season. They were filtering in and out, in and out. Whereas in the beginning, we had a lot of older people, neighbors, that loved to pick fruit. They had been migrant workers, whatever. But by the end of the 10 years in the blueberries, we were hiring a lot of teenagers. We called it teenage daycare. And they, they would uh, pick a couple of buckets and sit on the porch. And we really found out quite early, neither one of us are like the role of boss. You know, we're more hands-on people, uh, we can do it type people. So anyway, um, we did give up the blueberry farm and actually sold it and moved to Rusty's Place, which is another 80 acres, and surrounded by the National Forest, the Ozark National Forest. And in fact, it has a, it has a um, dirt road trail around the Armstead Mountain that we found out one day when we were looking at a, a forest map that the forest had named it Rusty Road. So he'd been there long enough <laughs> that he had a road. He has this old... Yeah, now Sue's original blueberry patch was one of the first uh, organic blueberry patches in the States. And at that time, there wasn't um, southern high bush. There weren't blueberries in Florida. The, um, so we were, blueberry marketing was really, we were the first to come on the market. So I spent about 10 years over there in the blueberries uh, with Sue. And then uh, one day I, you know, was at my place, which was five miles on the road, and came home on the tractor, no suspension on the tractor. The road was rough. I said, we ought to move back to my old place. And she said, OK, let's do it, just like that. So You had to sign a piece of paper. Yeah, she made me sign a piece of paper. We're moving. Um, <laughs> but um, we, we actually, this PowerPoint was for, um, we originally made for the Southern SOG Conference last year, and it's probably going to get a little lengthy, and I know we probably want to hear some questions and have some conversation here. Yeah. So I think we should. Just, we're going to run through along. it pretty, pretty quickly. Oops. What backwards. Then? Did you go back? There it goes. No. Yeah. Um, this is an overview. We have a windmill which uh, pumps water, gravity feed to the house, but we also have electricity now, so we have. That's me right there climbing the windmill tower, uh, taking that picture. So we'll, we'll whip through some of these. This is another shot off the windmill. The one was off that direction. This is here. This is row cover here. Well, we're starting spring seeds. There's spring plants in. Very valuable material uh, for protecting. It's a real lightweight crops. spun bond polyester material. Uh, we get a couple of seasons out of it if we're careful. Um, but it will keep the moisture in the soil for small seeds to germinate also keeps the insects off that uh, crop. Um, and a lot of times with eggplant or something like that, we'll put hoops up and put that over and we'll keep the eggplant under there until they start blooming. If it's an insect pollinated crop, we gotta take it off. But um, it gives, Wind protection as well. Yeah, and, yep. and slight frost protection. Uh, here's another shot completing the circle. Uh, 
That's the house. Uh, here's back in the blueberries. Um, that's not a great shot. It's obviously the middles need bush hogging pretty bad, but once the blueberries started ripening, you couldn't get close to them too much or you'd be knocking off a lot of berries. Uh, compost, uh, we've always, you know, really believe in compost. Uh, one of the um, books that's recommended on here, uh, there's seed sources and a few other things, but is uh, soil of the soil. And that's a great little look at the microbiology of the soil. Uh, which is one of the differences uh, between conventional farming and organic farming. Organic farming is talking about the life in the soil, and conventional farming is just feeding the plant. So we feed the soil, and uh, it's all getting, Constantly. you know, everybody's, you know, all farmers, though, are picking up techniques from both sides of this equation. And uh, that's, that's uh, at times beneficial, at times not. A nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. And I think we have quite a bit we could talk about uh, the destruction in our, of our soil. Here's another shot, some compost. And, um, we don't have any horses now, and so we have about 20 acres to mow. And I mow it, we bale it, and we pile it up, and we let it rot. So I'm actually, just like a lot of cattle farmers, I'm a grass farmer. But it's not going through the cow first, and they don't get their part. Um, we have considered integrating livestock into our farm, and I. Um, we go back and forth all the time. We had dairy goats early on for our milk. Uh, there's the manure spreader. Uh, disking in a cover crop, another essential part of, of organic farming is uh, building your organic matter in the soil. In the south, with high humidity, high temperatures, a long season, the microbiological activity in the soil continues for a long time, and that's eating up your organic matter the whole time. Some other uh, professional growers at the Southern Stog Conference last year said they have given up even testing for organic matter because it's so hard to build in the South. Um, it's an interesting point, though, as far as global warming and carbon in the atmosphere. I read uh, a statistic that if all the agricultural soil in the world was raised 1% in organic matter, we would capture enough carbon in the soil to solve our problem. And, and that's pretty amazing. But that's the whole world, too, getting everybody to start growing cover crops and turning them under. As but it is now, we're losing 3% of our soil. We're losing, in the, in the United year. States, yeah, 3% of the topsoil is gone. There's uh, uh, some rye and shows the height of it. Um, we didn't have our tallest person out there to demonstrate the height. <laughs> is that your cover crop there in the rye? Yeah. Um, so you're that, gonna turn, you're just going to turn that under and leave it. That, we're going to turn that. Didn't you? Yeah, and the buckwheat, same thing. That's buckwheat there. And that's blooming. We let it bloom for a while for the local bee population. They love, love that. It's uh, great. Um, and there is a real problem with bees now. Um, you've probably heard that. Um, so uh, the rye, if we want uh, more quickly available nutrition for the plants, we will turn it in when it's probably only knee high and mostly leaf. But if we want, are trying to build high organic matter, higher organic matter, longer lasting organic matter, won't rot down as fast, the stems and everything, that provides uh, more humus in the soil. Maybe There's another uh, cover crop faster. on fall beds. You know, hmm? maybe flick through a little faster. Okay, yeah, I'll keep moving. Uh, that is actually, it was a cover crop of winter, of fall planted oats. And there was crimson clover in there too, the oats winter kill, if we get a cold enough winter, last winter they actually, a lot of oats lived through. It was unusual, but it does happen. And so then you don't have as much uh, green biomass to deal with in the spring. It holds the soil all winter really well. Now we had uh, crimson clover that came on in, and it was in this field with the one next to it. Um, that was beautiful in the spring. Um, this is just a middle, but this is the way we prepare beds. We don't have a, um, a better, uh, so we uh, use the tools that we have. Uh, we, we don't, we're not highly equipped with tools, but I'm using the middle buster to plow out the centers. There's the middle busters. Uh, then I turn the back disc one way and that heats it up. And there's the showing the disc, back disc are turned, the front ones are straight. And then I put some old sickle knives on the back of the rototiller and that lays off seven rows on each bed after I till each of those beds. 
Uh, we may plant only that center row. We overmark the beds, but some uh, lettuce, uh, things, greens, uh, greens uh, carrots, beets, uh, spinach. spinach sometimes, uh, we'll sow on this. And those are only six inches apart, um, those rows. So we can do foot apart or we can do 18 inches apart. Uh, so we grow our own transplants uh, to be certified organic. Um, and we became certified, we were, we were certified organic, we were some of the first in the state. We helped develop the certification pro first certification program in the state done by Ozark Small Farm Viability Project, which we were members of. And when we started going to the river market, um, right after that, the USDA took over organic certification. And when that first happened, oh my gosh, the record keeping was gonna be outrageous. It was set up really for bigger farmers. You got 40 acres of one crop, it's pretty easy to keep track of what you do to that 40 acres. We were growing 100 different varieties during a year and every one of them, and we would replant in a bed, and so, you know, we're only planting 20 feet of something in a bed, and then when that's out, we plant something else, and if you add a little compost, you had to, everything had to be written down. Well, since then, the organic uh, certification process has loosened up a little bit. We get certified by Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma now, and, but we went to the uh, river market for 10 years, and we had the rapport with people. We could tell people what we were doing, and, uh, any answer any questions and so we felt like we really didn't need to put that extra energy into we, f we had some other uh, growers figure out how long it would take to do that record keeping and they figured an extra hundred hours of work a year and that's a hundred hours of work of paperwork you know <laughs> that's and that wasn't uh, really where we wanted to be at um, we still now we have to do some record keeping but it's not as intense they've kind of loosened things up Compost, if you use an animal manure in, in organics, uh, it has to be 180 days if it's fresh before a root crop and 120 days before an above ground crop. Um, and you have to monitor your compost piles, you have to take temperatures, there's all these record keeping things. But now when we're just we're composting our hay with no animal manure, manure we just call it rotted hay. And if you don't use that compost word when you get certified, um, it helps solve some of the problems. Um, so Sue yeah. does really all the, um, the seed starting just about. We have what, a little small hut and there's, uh, she's plugging some in. We do use some drip irrigation. Um, we have that skid steer loader there too, which is uh, sure beats the shovel we had for the first 15 years. <laughs> uh, this is some early tomatoes going in with one different bed in between. We have uh, homemade low tunnel. Uh, we'll come along here. Now here's a bed planted on six inch centers. And so um, there's a great book, it's called, and I'll read the whole thing here. Uh, how to Grow More Vegetables Than You Ever Thought Possible on Less Land Than You Can Imagine by John Jevons. And that's a great book for someone doing uh, intensive backyard gardening where you don't have much room. They double dig. Uh, we, we kind of try, we subsoil with a tractor if we can. We also have a U-bar, which is two handles. It's just, I got 14 inch tines on it. And inside the low tunnel, I'll do that whole thing in the spring. You know, and it's really pretty nice. It'll be 30 degrees out blowing wind and I'll be in there with no shirt on. Um, the, the tunnels have been amazing for us. Uh, direct seeding uh, of empty beds. I'm, I'm pulling a little pinpoint, I've got pinpoint seeder in my hand. I'm not actually using it there. Uh, we have various little seeders. There's the, uh, the pinpoint seeder is the upper left. Then there's a simple earthway. And here's a, a rake that we got from Johnny's Flex Seed, I believe. And they have, uh, you can get little pieces of plastic tubing you put on there and you can mark rows with that too. Each tine is an inch and a half apart. That's a really nice tool to have. Uh, if you want two rows 18 inches apart, you can just pour down the bed. Um, and it's great for preparing bed. The pinpoint cedar up on the left uh, needs pretty finely prepared bed. Um, it can, it can drag, start dragging stuff real easy. We also have a mechanical transplanter. This is uh, off the internet. I was, uh, didn't get a good picture of it when I made this, but uh, two people can sit on there. We put one seat on ours. Sue's really fast back there. She keeps going, speed up, speed up. <laughs> I'm falling asleep because it clicks every time it gives a little squirt of water. So 
So that, uh, planting sweet potato slips, uh, we've planted cabbage, different things with this. And we potatoes. Do, and potatoes. It has a different chain for, that just has a cup on it for potatoes. Change gears on it, you change spacing. Uh, it's a wonderful tool. But these have little neoprene grabbers. They come down, you set a plant in there, and it closes up, and it goes down, it opens up, and, it's, and uh, you can adjust how much water squirted right there, and it closes up right behind it. Um, Very simple. Quite a nice tool. The first time we grew um, three acres of sweet potatoes, we plugged them all in by hand. It was 33,000 plants. And uh, so it didn't take uh, much of that work before we started looking at a transplanter. Here's some spring garden shots. Uh, there's, a, there's a strawberry patch there. There's leeks and uh, garlic and onions. Uh, some more here. We'll try and get through this yeah, stuff. Yeah, we better. If anybody has, uh, what's that? Shout it out. Um, we do some, a lot of succession planting. Uh, this year, and most years, um, to keep summer squash going, um, it has a lot of pests. Powdery mildew is bad. We probably plant seven or eight times in a year. Um, so, and then to control squash bugs, which is important because uh, I know insects are on everybody's mind in here if you're gardening at all. Um, I've got a pro big propane torch. When that last planting's done, I go in there and just I, I flame it. And it doesn't take, I mean, you just pass that flame over a squash bug and it's dead. So this year, our last planting of squash, we don't have any squash bugs on it. And that's fairly incredible for deer. There's some winter squash, uh, I think that's some popcorn. Sweet potatoes, maybe on the other side. Late summer and fall, um, we're definitely believe, and we can you can redo spring planting all over in the fall. Uh, this year we almost weren't going to do it at all because of the weather, and then the weather broke in August, and so boy we got busy suddenly. And so we do have some turnips and beets you know, coming on. Uh, there's a bed of carrots that are planted intensively. That's a pretty close-up shot, but you can see it goes on. Fall potatoes. Like I said, I'm going to whiz through a lot of this. Uh, some coal crops, that's uh, cabbage or cauliflower, more lettuces. Um, cultivation. That's my track. Yeah, this is the <laughs> tractors that Sue uses. <laughs> Actually, it's a joke. They're little toys. But <laughs> I didn't know. I was hoping that everybody was understanding. I couldn't resist uh, putting that shot in there. <laughs> oh, I wish I was that small to get in there and cultivate like that. All right, and this is another type of cultivator that we use in our row crops. Um, this is the, some, some of the last uh, we had in our stallion was approaching 20 years old there. And uh, you can't hardly see it, but I have a net onion bag over his mouth so he's not trying to eat the whole time. He's going, <laughs> going, going through that corn. He's, the Suffolk horses were just wonderful horses. Uh, we had as high as 13 at one time. A mare that we raised in our place holds the record for the most foals. Um, and unfortunately, she had 17 babies in a row, 17 years in a row. Never missed a year. And we, three of them were sold as stud colts that were going to be gelded, and so we didn't register three of them. So only 14 of them were registered. She still holds the United States record. One of her daughters is in second place, uh, has 11 foals. So, uh, wonderful, wonderful horses. Uh, those are some peas, I think, uh, summer cow peas. Uh, here's some of our uh, hoes, and it's a homemade uh, push plow I made. That's the front forks off a little kid's 16-inch uh, bicycle wheel and the uh, handles off of an old rototiller. Um, I, do a lot of, I, I do a lot of welding and fixing and fabricating. Um, we're a ways from town. You just can't go and run and get something all the time. A lot of times you can't find it in town anyway. Um, the D hose, we really like those scuffle holes. Now, these are really well made. I think those are Swiss made. Uh, they stay sharp. You can get a lot of work done. Just, and then the other one, we call it Elliot. Elliot Coleman from up in Maine designed the co <laughs> collinear hole there. And collinear means that blade is right in the same line as your handle, whereas most hoes have that crooked neck and like that. And that hoe, you use both thumbs up. You're not out there, you know, back bent over hoeing. You're like this, and you're just scraping along. And so it's uh, after your bed preparation and your, uh, your things are coming up, you got to do close work. You only need to scratch the soil really shallow. If you scratch it deeper, guess what happens? Way more weeds germinate. Uh, light stimulates weeds to germinate. In fact, there, there are some places in Europe, they're cultivating at night with yeah. infrared because 
if there's when they're turning soil, this is a flash of light on that seed makes it germinate. Yeah. And it's pretty incredible. There's a lot of technologies. Finally, we're you know a lot of technologies are getting aimed For at more ecological, sustainable, um, low-tech farming. And in fact, um, the Elliot Coleman that we mentioned. He, I, we have um, a couple him, books on couple there. books yeah. by him. He's a farmer in Maine. Came after the Nearings, actually. Bought and land from the Nearings, actually. Yeah. 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 And he's developed some, you know, really nicely designed yeah, great small tools. farming great tools. tools. He's a sharp guy. Yeah. So yeah. The, he has two great books. More than that, actually, that we recommend. His books have been big sellers too, and it's really helped him out. That's, you know, as far as making a living. Uh, yeah, uh, we're not published yet. No. Irrigation, uh, without it this year, we would have been dead in the water. I mean, just, it would have been terrible. We do use, we use drip irrigation, uh, and we also have some three-inch aluminum pipe that is, uh, we have a 40-horsepower Kubota tractor that I was disking the buckwheat in earlier. It's in the background there. And so we have a big pump that does that. This year, we sucked one pond just dry with the with the um, sprinkler irrigation and the other pond we had just the drip going from and we had to actually stop irrigating some crops uh, we just didn't have the water this year and the stuff that was going on drip though we had almost well we got a third of that pond left now um, but it and it's gone on a month and a half two months after you know that. so the drip uses so much less water it's it's really worth using we've turned on several of our gardening friends um, to that. There's another sh more shots of And it can be installed quite reasonably, the drip systems, and, and it can be adapted to a very small garden. Um, it's, it's on our resource list here. Morgan County Seeds, uh, we found some of the best prices, and they're up in Missouri. They're not too far away, so the shipping isn't quite as high. Shipping's getting to be quite a uh, expense. So we have one high tunnel, uh, permanent, permanent in installation. Um, that's a 30 by 96. And then we have our homemade low tunnel on a PVC pipe. Uh, at this time, I don't think we had roll up sides on it. I've, I've uh, redesigned it so now we have roll up sides and that makes quite a difference. Uh, trying In to the pick, heat. Carry okay. things into the, into the seat. There you there. go. Well. There's the high tunnel. It has roll up sides uh, to begin with. I wouldn't buy another one quite like this. this and this is important. I would buy one. Uh, what they call a gothic shape. And it has straight walls and then goes up and has more of a, a little peak on it. I've spent several nights knocking snow off this thing. And also, the drip edge, when you roll it up, is right on the edge of your first bed. And so I did a whole gutter system on it. And it, it, was, it was a pain. And I would probably buy a little different design. This is early when these started getting popular. Um, there's some early crops in there. Uh, those tomatoes in the center were planted in, in March, and they actually went all the way till frost. February. Um, that was pretty amazing. We'd had a high wind, and those are carrots there, and you can see how they were blown over, and the peas are kind of blown over, and there was pole beans on the other side. This is uh, tomatoes. We had earlier crops in the three other beds, and then the tomatoes went on. And this is... Uh, Alan, don't look at this because you won't be interested, but uh, no. <laughs> this is a tea trellis that we make. We actually have uh, welded on scrap pieces of metal we, onto a small piece of pipe that just sits on top of a tea post. And then we put corral panels or hog wire, uh, woven wire, on top of that. Um, these, before these tomatoes fell over, they were starting to hit the ceiling up there at 10 feet tall, and they, then they fell over and they didn't collapse back against the main plant. They were hanging down out further. Um, this, this, this is cherries on that side, and this is a, um, a hybrid. This is a, this is a hybrid tomato called Esteva. Um, the Esteva that year, we averaged 26 pounds a plant. And that's pretty dang good. It went on forever. We were picking tomatoes right next to the ground but when it frosted. They had gone all the way up, over, and back down. Through November. Yeah, there they are there. Yeah, I'd just been picking some, and I thought, I should take a picture of this. And there's a, kind of the tea post up there, you can see. Okay. Um, and we, we really do like that. Inside the low tunnel, uh, that when we were going to the river market, uh, gosh, we wanted, you know, it starts in May. Well, uh, unlike 
some of these farmers who magically come up with watermelon in May at the river market. Um, <laughs> Uh, we were growing all our own stuff. So that was early carrots, early potatoes, uh, early beets, uh, once again beets and carrots. Uh, here's an earlier one where we tried a different uh, bed format. Uh, and here, we, when it started getting hot, we used to have to take the plastic off. Now our, our low tunnels, we can roll up the sides. And there's some other plant and coal crops and onions. Once again, more of these. Pest control, that's a big subject. Uh, Constant. Yeah, and that's just, uh, this is not really saying how we're controlling it. It's, it's a few pictures of them. Oh, there's another pest. Um, we had never dealt with a wild hog until, uh, you know, I came in 72 and in 99 or uh, year 2000, suddenly all our stuff started disappearing. And I mean, we had some heirloom corn, suddenly it was all gone. And edamame, the, uh, Yeah, edamame crops. soybeans, we had let go to seed. You know, the seed is very expensive. Well, I don't know if you know how hard a soybean is when it's, you know. And he, I heard him one night out there, and I go, what is that sound? And he was eating edamame seed like it was candy, you know, just crunching it up. So I had to shoot him. Uh, I set a trap. I didn't trap him, but I stuck out there. And uh, he weighed about 600 pounds. It actually might have been a state record, um, but I guess we weren't into doing that. We tried to make sausage out of him. It, <laughs> It wasn't bad at first, it kept getting stronger and stronger in the freezer. So the sows are really good. We have had to deal with that. Uh, local hunt camp let two loads of hogs go, uh, 22 hogs each time, 20, 25 hogs. And so um, this year we haven't been bothered with any. Last year I killed five and my neighbor killed 20. Um, now, um, for the last couple of years, we have what's called a 3D deer fence. And this is our other problem. Um, we're putting all these minerals on the land and building this land up and you grow a winter cover crop and you got rye out there this tall, it's just green as can be and oh my gosh, the deer, we'd have 50 deer on it. And they were just ruining our ground, uh, you know, in freezing, thawing winter, they're out there just plunking around, packing it and just tearing it up. They'd eat it down to the ground sometimes. So, and you couldn't shoot all of them, uh, and we drive them off a lot. We got a great Pyrenees who did a pretty good job, but they get used to her. She would run out so far, and they'd all stand in the woods and watch her. And then when she came back to the house, they'd just come right back out again. So, and this fence, for, for the first time, failed us this year in late June when it was so dry, we didn't have a good ground in the system. And, we were the and it was, we had about 20, 25 deer all around us, and I'd shine a line out there at night, and they're grazing right next to the fence. Okay, those were trained deer, but when it got dry and there wasn't anything to eat, they'd start moving, and if they could, went through that fence once, it's um, three foot high on the outside, or 34 inches, one strand that we bait, and that's uh, it's a poly wire that's got little fine wires in it, and then it's 48, 32, and 16 on the inside. And so when they have that, they call the 3D fence, they tend not to jump things when there's depth to them. And so they come up, and then every 50 feet, 50 to 100 feet, you have a little bait cap on there. And boy, they, their nose is one of the most sensitive parts of them. Their nose or their ears, their, their hair is hollow. They can sometimes crawl through electric fence, and if they don't push against it hard. So this has worked well until this summer. And then when they got on the inside, it, was, it wasn't the same effect. They could jump out easier. So um, it was only about three deer this year. We really didn't get damaged bad by them, but uh, it made me extremely nervous. And I was out there every night with the dogs walking around. And then here's another problem sometimes. That was an ice storm that totally coated us. Uh, large variety, especially vegetables, peppers, zephyr squash. We kind of became known for that at the market. We grew zephyr squash actually for 10 years at the market and no other grower grew it while we were there. And I just couldn't believe it. We had people come just for our Zephyr squash. And nobody else ever caught on. I think they've caught on by now. Um, it's, it's kind of the uh, drug dealer approach, where if they taste it, they'll want it. And they'll yeah. want more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It worked quite often. You were giving out free samples of Zephyr? <laughs> <laughs> OK, here's just some crops. And, uh, Others are yeah, this is uh, an heirloom butternut we grow. The biggest one was 20 pounds. Um, the vines actually, we grew it this year and I put corn on both sides of it, some field corn, uh, because it spread 35 feet out to each side. But on, last year on a 125 foot row, 
we picked over a thousand pounds of squash. I mean, it was just incredible. Uh, and the restaurants really like it. Probably the individuals don't like it so much, but the restaurants, they're going to make a big butternut soup, um, a lot less work. There's a nice little head of broccoli there that she's squinting at. Uh, that's all garlic in the back of the pickup. You can't see it too well. Here's uh, digging sweet potatoes. We do have a tractor-powered digger. Uh, it leaves them on top of the ground, and then we have to go through and pick them up. There's our little mighty shovel. And Big Red, that truck we bought when we first came, uh, it's still used on farm, no longer uh, well, roadworthy. Like... And there's Sue in there in the packing shed and wa washing some lettuce and greens. And she's just having a great time sorting those beans, it looks like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and our outside sink and uh, some of the more packing room stuff, more packing room stuff. Uh, we have a potato washer. Um, we don't grow as many potatoes as we did. Um, Although that, those are turnips. Those are turnips there, yeah. Now we do, we definitely wash beets and turnips and everything in here. The first part is brushes and water spraying on it. Uh, then it goes out to a, a sorting table, a roller table. And the last piece down there is actually a potato grater. It grades it into three sizes. It's, it's an ancient piece of machinery. It uh, was hand cranked when it was first done. And that had to be a heck of a job. So we're getting to, here's a, when we went to the farmer's market, some of the early years there. Uh, we were the, I think the first certified organic grower there. Um, this is early morning setup. This is some of our last years there. We had a uh, pretty nice setup. We'll run through a few pictures here. Some of you people are former customers, thank you. Out here we recognize several faces and people and said hello and so you've seen all this already. <laughs> uh, you know, we would do things, we'd grow you know, a lot of variety. So there's three colors of carrots there. We'd grow three or four colors of carrots. Uh, uh, let's see, there is a point here. There's uh, multi colors of potatoes. And same with beets, we do several. Uh, we really like doing all the different varieties and really uh, quite a display. That was probably the most fun of all our marketing we've done, is going to the farmer's market. And if anyone's thinking of growing in here, it is a great way to get uh, in, in a market. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. When Even if it's really have, uh, excess garden. Yeah. Now, yeah. Sue, now, to the restaurants, and um, she does all our marketing. But uh, we were both strong marketers at, at the farmer's market. But Speaking without Sue's uh, yeah. marketing, we probably wouldn't be anywhere right so online buyers club. Uh, these are some of the pictures that we use, which uh, we have uh, from the Arkansas locally grown online market. These are free, hot off the press. Some local a resources. Lot of resources of farms and There's a beautiful little booklet. And, uh, uh, urban uh, gardening. Yeah. To buy local, and there so are make a sure you pick them. one of those up. Here's our employees. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Ralph is gone now. He was the greediest dog we ever knew. I saw him ride a hog down the hill on, on the hog's back, biting his butt. Uh, he'd see a skunk out in the field, he'd go and just run right over that skunk and then, oh, shake his head and turn around and <clears throat> kill it. A few dogs will hit a skunk twice. <laughs> so anyway, there's some, that's daughter Rose and one of her friends who helped us. Uh, that's still an early morning picture and we always had some early bird customers there wanting to get those first tomatoes. And there we are, so we are set up there. Food is power, are you in control of yours? Uh, that's the windmill we have. We have a water pumping windmill, pumps it up into a 2,000 gallon tank. It's in the little rocket ship building there. Uh, it's gravity flow to the house. We now have a pressure pump under the house. Uh, we had this though when we had no electricity, so we just had eight pounds of water pressure. Now we have, a, um, we're electric now. But we still pump with that, and so when the electric does go out, we still have running water, uh, and we have a wood stove. So we had two weeks without electricity, that one ice storm. <clears throat> the care of the earth is our most ancient and most worthy, and after all, our most pleasing responsibility. To cherish what, what remains of it and to foster its renewal is our only hope. Good old Wendell Berry. And there's a view out the, our bedroom window, which is very nice, except we're seeing all the work that's not done <laughs> all the time. And there we go. Yeah, I like that one. There's another crop of buckwheat here. Um, and uh, We've been blessed. With yeah, we've been, we've been really blessed. Yeah.
Are you no. kidding? Sorry, I'm sorry. And I want to ask all the questions. Ah, wow. Oh, my. And I thought I went fast. I didn't. <laughs> we can talk afterwards. If yeah, you yeah I, if anyone wants to come up. We, yeah, go ahead. Or is there another event right here? There, there, there will be another event. That's why I've got to. Yeah. We can go outside. Okay, there is a question here. I do have a question. Uh, I'm planting a garden at our local school, and I'm wondering, we're just next week planting, and do you have any advice on what to plant right now? Um, plant right now, uh, you know, spinach. Uh, a lot of the Asian greens are very cold hardy. Um, lettuce, winter You know, lettuce. for down here, see, we're about two weeks uh, different than... Uh, we, we're pro you guys are two weeks later than us or earlier. You know, anyway, we're, we're at 1,600 feet elevation in the Ozarks. Yeah, yeah, about two weeks earlier. <coughs> um, yeah. And uh, so I'm not quite sure what would go. I know we have beets right now that are just this big, and turnips definitely. Uh, Haikurai turnips, it's a Japanese turnip. Uh, they're, gosh, they're 28 days or 35 days. They're, they're pretty quick. Um, but some things will winter but, over. But a lot of greens Especially and, if you put them and in spinach. Um, the other thing, we talked to someone at the um, get-together last night who said, you know, last year my son put up a little hoop house in our backyard. It was only 10, 12 feet long, you know, used PVC and covered it, and they had lettuce all winter. And so that tiny so bit of protection really is, is. Re that really, I mean, we've had lettuce su uh, survive 11 degrees below zero outside, four degree, degrees below zero inside a tunnel. But there was something about not having that desiccating wind and everything on it. Uh, it it's incredible. Um, so that's always a thought. Um, and uh, the, rim, uh, the row cover uh, also will you know, give you some protection. It depends how much you're there to monitor, because uh, the tunnels will get hot really fast. So. And if it's at a school, Honestly. there might not be somebody there, you know, at every time you need to do that. What else? Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Last uh, question. I was wondering, how do you guys choose the things that you grow? Oh, that's right. Uh, how do you choose the things that you grow? Because, like you were saying, for 10 years you grew zephyr squash and no one else did. But now you see other growers because there's more small farms. Yeah. Um, and so there's more, the same, like more things are being grown, but you guys seem to stay kind of ahead of growing things that other people aren't growing. So I was wondering how you choose. <coughs> well, talking to other growers. Um, Reading seed the catalogs. catalogs. I did. Uh, Johnny selected seeds in Albion, Maine. Um, usually when they say something tastes good, it tastes good. You know, and, and that's, uh, as far as dealing with restaurants, you want to bring quality product. And, and at farmer's markets, you want things to taste good, look good, and it takes a big effort to do that, but it will pay off in longevity of your market. But that's not to say that we, you know, in the dead of winter, you're in the house, it's nice and cozy, and you get all the catalogs out. And of course, the descriptions all sound great. Yeah, so they're always all invariably great. Invariably, we go, okay, we're only going to grow six varieties of tomatoes. Yeah. Well, so guess we plant what? 20 tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, maybe, maybe half are good. So it's a constant, constant learning yeah, experience yeah, yeah, yeah. as far it's as what works. Hours. And something and might it, work one year. Like I said, there are so many next. variables. Uh, one of my gardening friends up there, they just put in a big garden for themselves, but he said, the variables, the variables. He said, it's like trying to count the stars in the sky. And you finally get it done, and you learn out a bunch of more galaxies. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Y'all, the Newpers are going to be here to continue talking. I want to thank you guys so much, and uh, really appreciate it.